Before we start dealing with Spark, there's one last thing that we should consider, and that is the implications of doing operations in parallel. And we can talk about this in the context of Scala's parallel collections. So if you go into the Scala standard library and look at their API, there is under collection a package called parallel, and it has a number of different things in it, one of which is a parallel sequence. We've mostly been dealing with the higher order methods on sequences. I uh, haven't worked too much with, with maps and sets other than the fact that we've produced some, for example, group by produced maps for us. Uh, but a lot of the operations wind up being very similar. So how do things change when uh, we do things in parallel? And I guess there's also the question, do, have we talked about any operations that really don't work in parallel. Clearly Spark is going to be doing things in parallel, not just in a multi-threaded way, but distributed across many machines, and so we need to be aware of what happens when we do this. Well, there are a few operations that we have looked at, in particular the fold and reduce operations that we've played with. So for example, we had a reduce left here and a uh, fold left here. That are inherently sequential. Okay, the fold left goes from left to right across the collection from the low indices to the high indices. And when we combine things, you know, we have the safety of knowing that they were combined in that order. So it's worth looking at some simple examples of what it really means to do the fold and then what it would mean to do these things in parallel. So to help illustrate this, I am going to just make a separate application and we will make an array with just a few numbers in it. Four, two, seven. Okay. What can we do with this? Well, I'm actually going to stick to simple math operations even though you know there are things that exist to do this. For example, I can use a fold left to add up these elements by saying that I'm, well, actually I can just say underscore plus underscore here because what I'm really doing is my accrued sum and an integer rocket s plus i. In a simple situation like this, I can simplify that to underscore plus underscore. And let's just go ahead and print line this and run it so we can see that this really does work and do what we want. There we go. Okay, 26. So, you can add that up. This should, yep, 26. What is this really doing? Well, it turns out that what fold left does is it takes our zero value, so it's going to do zero plus four plus two plus seven plus three plus nine plus one. That's not a zero at the beginning. There we go. I'll put this in a comment. But it not just does that, you can picture it as grouping these things from left to right. So effectively it's like putting these parentheses in here. There is also a fold right. If I had called fold right, this would be the values in our collection, 4 plus 2 plus 7 plus 3 plus 9 plus 1 plus our 0, and a fold right would have grouped it in this manner, from the right to the left. Now this is all great and fine when you're doing things sequentially, and of course for addition, the answer to these two expressions is the same. Why is that? Well, because the plus operation is associative. So it doesn't matter what order uh, we do the operations in. But if I go to a parallel situation, then I'm probably not going to do these all going from left to right or from right to left because that would require uh, things happening in kind of a sequential order. So what do I need to do? Well, the thing is when I do this in parallel, I might wind up having the four plus two happening as well as the 7 plus 3 and then the 9 plus 1. Once again, that's all fine for plus. What if I change this to minus? Oops. 
Well, now this one is kind of interesting. So this one's negative 26, which is 4 minus 2 minus 7 minus 3 minus 9 minus 1. Uh, when we were doing this, or actually I guess it is 0 minus 4 minus 2 minus 7 minus 3 minus 9 minus 1, as opposed to if instead I did a fold right, I get a different answer. If we were to do this in parallel and break it up in different ways, we would definitely get different answers. We can actually demonstrate that. Instead of having a normal array, we can call dot par, and then we get a par array. And instead of calling fold, right or left, I'm just going to call the more generic fold negative 14, 0, <laughs> negative 14, negative 14. So negative 14 is the most likely outcome because it's a small collection, but we did see a 0 in there. There are probably other possible outcomes, and as our array would get larger and larger, and it would more effectively work on multiple threads, we could definitely get different results from doing this. This operator, when worked in parallel, has to be associative. In addition to that, the fold, when done, uh, the basic fold that doesn't use a right or a left, is more limited in types. We can see that in the documentation. If we go down to the fold, well, fold left and fold right have a completely separate type S, which is the type of R0 and the type of the output. The regular fold has a type U, which has to be a super type of T, which is the type of collection. So we can't just use any type we want. We have to use some type that is a super type of the collection, which generally means it's the same type as the collection. That's fine for my simple example here, because in my simple example, I'm just doing two ints and getting out an int. But if I wanted to get out any other type, this fold generally wouldn't work for us. So how do we get around that? One thing to note, we don't get around the associativity. The function that we are going to use here really needs to be associative. But there is another operation in the API that in some ways is like a more complex fold, but it works well in parallel, and it's called aggregate. It takes a zero, just like folds do, but it takes two different functions, a sequential operation, and you'll notice this one takes type S and a type T to S. This is, looks just like what fold left or fold right would get. And then it also takes a combine operation, which takes two things of type S and combines them together. This allows us to have the flexibility of types of a fold while still potentially having the uh, ability to do things in parallel uh, and in a random order. So the sequential operation will be done across chunks of our collection. Our collection will be broke up into chunks and this operator will be used to combine things in a sequential way in those chunks. But then all the different chunks get combined using this operator. This operator doesn't have to be associative, but if it's not, you're probably going to get weird results. Uh, this operation does have, definitely have to be associative. Um, let's look at that here. So instead of calling fold, I'm going to call aggregate with a lowercase a. I start with zero and now for once again for this toy example it turns out that both of my operations are the same. My sequential operation is add together the results. My uh, combine operation is to add together the results. To make this more interesting though let's go back to the method that we had here where we used a fold left and this was a more complex fold where we were uh, calculating our rainy days in a single pass. So we needed to calculate the sum of them and their count, so we were getting an average temperature, but we said we were going to do it in a single pass. This uses a fold left. It is inherently sequential. If I had parallel data here, it wouldn't help because I'm using a sequential method. So let's change this instead so that it uses a an aggregate. Okay, our zero is going to stay the same, but one big thing that happens here 
is that our second argument list now has two arguments in it. So I took this first case here, and it's exactly what we had before. This is the one that's going to go through sequentially. It's going to take and aggregate a sum and a count with the new day. And if the precipitation is less than 1, it just gives you the sum and the count. Otherwise, it adds in t max and adds 1 to the count. Now, what happens in our aggregating operation? The one that takes two things of type, you know, of our, of our other secondary type, which in this case is a tuple. Well, if I want to write that, so I'm taking two tuples here. I'm going to call them S1 comma C1 and S2 comma C2. I need an open parentheses there. Close that and rock it. So now this is a function that takes our two different tuples, the sum and the count, like that, that we got from two different combinations. Either they had come from applying this function here, or we have a result from, from this previously. Well, it turns out this one is actually fairly simple. We're going to return a new uh, a new tuple which is S1 plus S2 and C1 plus C2. And I put an M instead of a comma. Okay, and there we go. If I were to run this, we should get the same result that we had before. The difference is that this particular operation here can happen very quickly uh, on a multi-core machine because it can utilize many of the cores on it. Once again, these operations need to be associative. If you start throwing in non-associative operations when you're doing parallel computations, you basically get random results depending upon how things are scheduled. This is kind of an introduction to the things we have to pay attention to because all of the Spark stuff is going to be done in parallel distributed across many machines.